Well, uh, good evening, evening here. Um, this video is going to be a uh, title different than uh, um, previous videos, which all start off with uh, uh, house building. Uh, everything we're doing in the Philippines has got to do with this house, but uh, STV Box, uh, I guess his name is Steve, um, he suggested I, I title the things more with what the content is. And we are a content channel. We're not monetizers, no ads, you know. So uh, I opened up with this uh, uh, still, this picture that's come from the crew of a concrete mixer because uh, they're about to pour some concrete with it and I needed a, something I could take a snapshot of in the video for the thumbnail. So that's why we're starting with that. Uh, Obviously, you have to have a place to pour concrete. This is a, a around about 30,000 gallons. It's uh, 14 feet wide and 46 feet long. Uh, it's interior dimensions, the water dimension. The tank is 7 inches thick. Uh, I don't know if you can see up there. No, you can't because I've got it pointed the wrong way. In the background, that's the uh, septic tank with the partition walls finished. Uh, and that just sort of gives you some idea where it is on the property. It's, it's next to the uh, um, septic tank. Okay, so uh, we're, uh, what we did is we found the, uh, the lowest corner of where we're going to put it. And we just dug the ground down uh, to that depth. At the other end, they're digging around two feet of dirt away. Um, this is a, uh, what we call a single bin bar. They go the length of it and then turn up. All the bars uh, in the floor turn up into the walls for the best uh, anchorage we can get from the wall to the floor. Because, you know, uh, you really can't have your water running away when, like, we're going to do uh, uh, tiger shrimp in this one. And uh, that has to have salt water, or at least brackish water. So we want to keep the water where we put it. Okay, after you dig the hole down, and then you take a, a square point shovel and run it along sort of parallel to the ground and get all the high spots off. Uh, the next thing we would do is we put down plastic. The idea of the plastic is the wet cement, any water of hydration that's got cement in it, you don't want it to go sinking into the ground. Now you can uh, hose down your, your dirt if you haven't got plastic. And once you saturate the ground, uh, it will uh, keep the cement from going into it which has also swelled up the dirt. So uh, it's going to go to a, a natural level of water content, which will be less than what you do when you soaked it down. Now, we didn't compact the uh, dirt when we poured the floor for the house. Reason being, it was uh, uh, you know the peak of dry season, and it was just hard as chalk. Uh, and plus, it had been rained on for a whole rainy season, and people walking back and forth, and it had been leveled. So uh, we didn't use a plate compactor or anything because we knew the moisture was going to go up and it would push the dirt against the floor, making it tight. It'd be tight when, the day we poured it, but uh, it would be tighter yet later on. And that has uh, worked out, by the way. So we put plastic down here. Now, you can't hardly buy polyethylene in the Philippines. I think it's illegal to possess it. But you can buy this tarpaulin material. Uh, you can get it like 12 feet wide. Now, I think they did horizontal strips of it. Um, okay, what you can see in this picture is several things. Uh, over here, these are what we call notched boards, like a, a board with notches in it. And the uh, notches are the spacing you want your rebars. Now, you can have a rectangular grid or a square grid, and they can have different notch spacings. The notch boards have uh, uh, at least two sides with different spacings on them. Some of them have, uh, near the end, they'll have a bunch of them close together because they were used for a beam one time. But those are all added to this standard pattern. So if you're using them for uh, a floor or a wall, then you just skip those those extra ones. Um, the grid on this, it's number 12 bars, 7 and 3 quarter on center. And every bar goes up the wall uh, 42 inches. Uh, the, the top of this, uh, tank will be three feet, 36 inches. I don't know what that is in, um, well, it's, uh, a meter minus three inches. 
you know, 36 versus 39.37 uh, inches for a meter. That's so that they're all, everything that's around the house looks like it was meant to be there. It's going to be three feet above the gutter. Uh, our gutter is, um, uh, it prevents uh, ants from coming in the house unless they can swim. Uh, or they come across the uh, the little bridge there at the uh, main door. The rest of the doors, you have to step over the water. Uh, the other thing it does is uh, when we pull in cool night air, uh, or even daytime, any air that comes in the house, this is a, a thermal chimney kind of house, uh, open atrium right to the roof with uh, big slotted uh, openings uh, that the air blows across. Anyway, we want to pull in damp, cooler air to take away the heat from the thermal mass. So looking out the windows, you're going to see these tanks. And uh, right now the tilapia tank is finished. This is the first uh, shrimp tank. But we want them all three feet above the uh, gutter so they look like they belong. And to the right of this over here is where the solar panels go. And we haven't started on that at all. Uh, we haven't completely designed and, and uh, finished drawings, but we just haven't uh, done anything on it. We're going to do... Uh, this shrimp tank, they poured the floor already, but when we'll get through that, it'll be in this video. And they're starting on the, the floor for the next one. Right now, we've got a bunch of rebar to climb over and getting in and out of the door. So I told them just to go ahead and pour the floor and get that rebar in the concrete. Uh, we've not lost any rebar since we've built and building because we have a guy who lives on site and he's real conscientious. However, no use tempting people. Uh... So uh, there's more rebar to go in this other than what you see. There'll be uh, a straight piece here, uh, two feet long, and it ends, uh, okay. This rebar, these vertical rebars around the edge are 13 and a half inches from the edge of the slab. With a seven inch wall, that leaves 10 inches uh, of un unrebarred concrete. So every other one of these uh, bars will have an extension stuck onto it. Uh, that's uh, an inch and a half less than the 13 and a half because you have to have concrete cover. And there'll be two bars running down the uh, uh, side out here just to, because uh, it's foundation. We didn't pour a deeper foundation in a shower or floor. We're going to do that on the uh, solar panels, but we don't want to do it on a, on a tank. So what we did is we poured the whole thing eight inches just like we would, we were doing a... Uh, monolithic slab with a deeper foundation under the walls. Uh, we want to uh, avoid cracking when it, uh, when it cures. Eh, it might be Nanny. Um, okay, at this point they've got the, the bars pretty much all the way around and they're, they're putting uh, one bar up near the top. Uh, I don't know if you can I don't know where my point is. There it is. Over here you can see one. This isn't measured yet. This is just stuck on there. The idea is to keep them from, from looking like they do on the left. So uh, we have another notch board that's got a pattern to it. More uh, bars near the sur the edges of a slab wall. Well, actually. They're like inch and a half and then three inches and then like five inches. And then they're ten, 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 ten. And then the, the closer together it starts again at the top. We do slip forms on these. Uh, so we have to put the bolts in the holes. And when you don't, you can't slip it up because uh, there's no place to put your anchor bolts. Uh, and they've uh, learned that now the hard way. They're having to render the dirty kitchen on the outside. Uh, this is an optical illusion. Somebody had their notch board slid over when they... Uh, uh, we're, we're starting to tie it, and so it, it made the whole pattern uh, shift for some reason. And we're not going to correct it. We're going to just leave it. Now, down here at the bottom, you see these bars all laying down. That's because we're going to take the cement mixer into the forms. Uh, that's more you another view of the notch boards in use. And you can see the different spacing on the one on the left. It's got a wide spacing also. That's probably nine and a half inch spacing instead of seven and three quarters. Um, not sure where that was used. Might have been. I think it was a beam, because the beams are like fourteen by twenty four, and uh, your your um, your widest legal spacing on a beam 
is the width of the concrete, uh, you know, which is a narrow direction of a beam. And our beams are uh, 14 inches, so we could go 14. But uh, that's, uh, well, I go to the maximum. Uh, if you're putting up uh, stirrups on a 25-foot beam, um, two stirrups is penny ante. You know, it's a part of a bar. So, uh, you know, one bar to the beam, um, 220 pesos or thereabouts. Because uh, the stirrups are only number 10. The uh, long runs are 16 on the on the beam. Anyway, these these are laid over and, and then tied. And when they back the mixer out of this hole, they'll stand them up uh, as they pour in it so that at least the, the last five feet will be in sloppy wet concrete. Well, not sloppy wet because we use uh, water weight equal to, to the cement weight, the, the Portland cement weight. So it's a fairly stiff mix. Uh under perfect conditions and not so blasted hot and windy uh, all over the slab while you're while you're working it while it's curing, that can achieve eight thousand pound uh, strength. Uh, we're designing for four thousand, and uh, be happy at, at twenty seven hundred. Like in the U.S., it would still be a plenty strong tank. But uh, we're doing a one two three mix one one Portland cement two sand three gravel. Uh, gravel's three quarter inch stone. Uh, we've used that through the whole build. Uh, we're getting some uh, from City Lights. There's a fellow that works there that has a, a giant uh, dump truck. I mean giant. It's it's not only five axles. It's uh, I don't. It's long, but it it does dump. You don't have to shovel it off, and and they unload it. Uh, the fellow's name is Wilson. If anybody goes to City Light, he works there. But he sells this really hard, uh, like uh, almost obsidian rock, and we really like that because the strength of the concrete is in your gravel. Okay, so uh, we beat this picture to death. Uh, it's another view of pretty much the same thing. As you can see, they, they've got bars down the side, but they not put them in notch boards. They just sort of run up and down all over the place. The one on the end looks a little more level, but it didn't have to because they'll be uh, they'll be spaced net with uh, vertical notch boards, uh, and it'll be perfect when they're done. But today we just have to have something there. Uh, this is, uh, another, about the same thing with Nanny not in the picture. Okay, then we got, uh, Benji, Ferdinand, and Pennell. And they're just, see, they're just holding that wherever it looks good to them. All they're trying to do is get these, these bars where they're, they're close enough to upright at the bottom that when we go to put them where they really belong, we don't have to bend them much down here. Just spring them over a little bit and you're good to go. So they're, they're, just, they're just trying to get something on it to so that they're not leaning over 45 degrees, which makes them come out of the concrete at the wrong place. Uh, this is Boyette shoveling and one of the girls on the crew, uh, Bia. Uh, she does just about everything. She, she bends the rebars and she holds bags when they shovel them. We tried the, the bottomless bucket method for the things, but uh, one run wrong shovel shovel before you got to throw your shovel down and get the bag reset. And we find that having somebody uh, hold the bag while they throw the stuff in it makes an accurate uh, weight on the bag, and uh, the actual labor cost is less <laughs> with two people than one. Okay, this is Nanny uh, using a paint roller to, to wet down his uh, place he got a patch. See, see all the missing bolt holes here, all along there. There's at least four bolts that weren't put in that uh, in that slip form when they poured this section. So when they slipped them up, you only had bolts here and there. So your your forms are gonna uh, probably bulge out. See th those bolts that go through there. There's a piece of plastic PVC pipe, like blue pipe, and that's the spacer for the thickness of the wall. So without the bolt holding up against that spacer. Uh, I'm not. I'm surprised it's, if they didn't have such stiff concrete mixes. I don't think it would have worked at all. They got lucky there. I got lucky there. Oh, uh, we asked them how much gravel pile was left. We weren't trying to figure out when we needed to buy some. Okay, now they're starting to set up. Um, once once they get get it right, they'll be. Uh, uh, two columns of uh, sand and three columns of uh, 
uh, rock. So I imagine these two on the left is, is sand, and they're working on rock. Well, these could all three be rock, and you're going to do two sand. The other side uh, over here, you can see they got five rows wide over there. That's what that's the, that's the goal. Um, uh, 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 wrong way. Okay, you see we got the mixer down at the end. Now they're going to throw the stuff in the mixer, spin it for three minutes, and you can dump that mixer to the left or to the right. Uh, so they're just going to dump it out of the mixer and then stand the mixer back up. We normally dump the mixer into uh, half of a 20-liter uh, uh, pony keg with a rope handle we, we put on them. Uh, it's about uh, two and a half times as much concrete as you see other videos. Um, but uh, they like that quantity. Uh, it's not such a hectic pace. Uh, they weigh about 80 pounds. You know, uh, but, but Bia's in the bucket brigade. You know, she she pulls them, you know, carries them just like everybody else. You wouldn't think somebody that small could, could pick up a bucket of concrete, but usually she catches it out of the mixer and uh, just grabs the handle and slides it down a piece of plywood to the next guy. So she really doesn't have to, to pick them up. Uh, but she does have to hold them up when, it, when they drop the concrete in it, and that's got to be harder. Uh, we have three water barrels. Uh, we won't start the uh, uh, the pour until all three of them have water in them, because that'll take care of uh, of this one slab. If if no matter what happens to the water, we're good to go. The first barrel will probably stay about where it is, and these other two will be staged uh, farther down on the slab. Because when this barrel gets down to like a a foot deep, we'll be passing it with the concrete. At that point, they'll take a a, a bucket and uh, put the water in something, another barrel or whatever, and, and then take that barrel out of the form. But this next one will be down here someplace. And when they take this barrel that's uh, uh, near empty, they'll take it to the other uh, end of the form, just outside of the slab, and they'll put the hose in and start filling it up. Um, just in case. Never can tell. Uh, this is a picture of a bunch of bags stacked. And you see the vertical bars... Are, are much neater now with just that one piece running across them. Uh, this is rainy season. So when it rains, uh, they go up to one of the, there's five of those lanais around that uh, that level of the house. It looks like B on the left and Al and Pitch Shell. There's... Um, a crew of six poured this floor we're looking at. We usually have ten, but six people did this one. They're showing us that, uh, like this bag at the top, it's not a bag anymore. We take our bags at the end of a pour and we put uh, 19 in, in, into one. So only the outside bag is in the UV. But when you're working really steady, they're always full of, of uh, filling them full of uh, gravel and then you can't hide them from the UV. So uh, the bags deteriorate. Plus, you get one cement bag uh, every time you you uh, pour uh, five bags of sand and gravel. So you have to use your reuse your bags five times uh, if you want to be able to pour concrete. But we found out that the people who make concrete blocks, uh, once they know you want the bags, they'll put them aside. And they already have 20, uh, you know, 19 into one. That's that's how we knew how many to put. And uh, they're as little as two pesos a piece and as high as four pesos a piece. And being at the cement is 220 pesos a bag. It's a pretty good deal. And we buy them uh, usually uh, 400 at a time. If you're pouring a lot of concrete, you need a lot of bags. Uh, okay, this is showing... Uh, what happens when your forms on slip forms are either one, not enough bolt holes to be pulled up tight and, and some of that mess pushed out and got down. Uh, we have uh, uh, tools to grind it or chip it, but we don't bother. We just put a render on it. Uh, this is uh, honeycomb. And when you're pouring your concrete pretty dry, uh, you're likely going to get some honeycomb. Um 
I'm not sure why we have a, looks like a mark of a form, but this uh, window ledge up here someplace at eight inches above that ledge is where the top of the four foot form was. Somewhere right around in here. See, if you, if you have to be able to get this concrete in underneath your buck, and uh, that's much harder than it seems. A vibrator doesn't necessarily do it. A lot of things don't do it. I find that if you, uh, like if I'm pouring uh, from this way, I'll, I'll put that concrete up uh, probably two or three feet above the bottom of the buck, and most of it will come over. And you you can see it when it's leaving over here. You know, when it, when you look down from the top, you can see how much air gap you got on this end. And you can figure that's a pretty even slope all the way across. So that's what you have to, to get it back into. So when you start pouring up uh, past the buck, you take a stick and use like a boat, boat paddle or you get a piece of rebar and run it back and forth and a piece of bamboo and jounce it up and down. But you got to get some in in there. That's much harder than it seems. And that's one of the reasons why we did round windows on that. Like, you, can, you can't see them. I can see them. What you see there is a round window in the uh, kitchen. That's in the kitchen. And the the little round hole at the uh, upper right, that's an uh, exhaust fan for over the stove. 14-inch exhaust fan, industrial fan. It's an industrial kitchen, actually. Um, more crappy bags. Uh, this is a uh, boy. He's putting these... Uh, Hmm. See, there's some two-foot pieces laying down here at the bottom. He's a sister nose onto every other one of the uh, bars, and then putting two bars outside. Uh, here he comes farther. And you see how crowded that floor is getting with uh, bags and stuff and ramps and things. You needed a, a, a ladder to get in and out of this end because it was so deep into the ground. Okay, that's Boyette. He has finished 75% uh, of the concrete we've poured. Nene's done the rest. Uh, everybody does a little bit, but uh, uh, we got a guy that's a welder, and he fixed the bull float. The float blade is magnesium, but the rest of it's aluminum and steel. And he's managed to put that back together because we... Uh, Skillfully broke it. And you see, uh, oh, it doesn't show in the video. But this floor is starting to dry here outside of the rebars on the right-hand side. I mean, the water is, is uh, uh, we, we call it water rise and waterfall. It's on waterfall right now. And uh, you see where the mixers parked, how much dirt they had to dig out to pour this slab. That's on the left, and uh, you can see it's starting to dry there on the left. Now, they may have been hosing this down a little bit to keep the water in it. Because it's going to rain at the end of the day. Uh, that's the new bags that was uh, uh, bought. That's how they look when we get them off the tricycle. There's another picture of the same thing, new bags. Well, once used bags, they're not new. Uh... This is a picture somebody's uh, sent of the of the dirt hole is not quite finished yet. Shows it, but they're still digging. That's another one from before it was poured. Um, nah. that's what we move our cement in. It's a half of a twenty liter uh, bucket. You take a piece of uh, three quarter inch rope. There's a knot tied here, so that it won't. Uh, Pull through the hole in the bucket. We drill the holes in the bucket with a uh, Irwin speed bore bit or the equivalent flat bit. Another picture of the bucket. More bucket. Birds of paradise leaves, I guess. Yeah. We found that those will actually grow in our crappy dirt. They grow very well in that dirt. I don't know what they need, but they found it. Uh... Well, that's Boyette. Uh, what he's looking at here is the the dirt uh, dig for the, uh, the second uh, shrimp tank. These are going to be white-legged shrimp. 
Uh, they're from uh, Mississippi, I believe, U.S., and they were imported to Japan and from Japan to the Philippines. Uh, they're sort of a purebred sh uh, shrimp as far as I know, but they grow fast, they grow big, and they're really tasty. Uh, did I mention they're really tasty? <laughs> it's like the tiger shrimp. Uh, we grow them because they're really tasty, uh, but they also grow to about 10 inches long, so they're... Uh, uh, one of them is a, is a family meal, uh, for, for some people. So that's, uh, they go for uh, around 700 pesos a kilo. It takes two of them for a kilo, maybe three. Uh, where the, uh, smaller shrimp, uh, the prime selling size is 60 to the kilo. And if you have 120 or 130, you you won't get the feed cost back out of them. So you have to compete with people who catch them in the open ocean. And uh, they have no feed cost. They just have boat repair costs. Um, we call that uh, uh, straws. <laughs> I don't know why. That, that's, a, that's that green plastic that comes all rolled up like, a, like, a, like string, but it's only an inch wide or so. And that's what they use to, to lay out the stuff with because you don't fall over it like you do... Uh, Nason's twine, which is almost invisible when you're working hard and turn around. We don't want to hurt nobody. So we use a nice big visible line. They'll actually switch to a transparent fishing line later on. But by that time, everybody's stepping kind of careful. He's trying to figure out what he wants to do next. <laughs> I told him to take the day off. They, they worked uh, about 10 hours straight pouring concrete. They poured uh, 119 bags of cement, 120 bags of cement. Uh, the guess was 119. Uh, 120, that would be 240 sand and 360 bags of uh, gravel. That's 500 bags of sand and gravel and 120 of Portland cement. And for six guys, that's a lot of work in a day. So we gave them a little extra bonus. I told them they, they, I, if, if they wanted to do it in a day and they, and they wanted an incentive, we'd do, come up with something. And uh, they come up with what they come come up with, and I was figuring I'd just pay them for the two days rather than having a, a cold joint in the in the floor. I'd rather pay them two days uh, pay to do it all in one day if they had to stay till nine o'clock at night. But they got done at five, so they uh, uh, everybody's agreed on the compensation. We're good to go. Yep, another one. <laughs> He's more enthusiastic than he looks. He's really meticulous. He's going to get his uh, plastic hose full of colored water and, and get that thing absolutely level. He's a very meticulous person. He also runs the bakery. Maybe his daughter's taking these pictures because he's in a few of them. I think that's all the pictures. Okay, so what we've seen today is how we uh, put rebar, how we space it, how much there is, uh, what the mix of the concrete is, the fact that we bring the mixer right to the job. We did that on the house. There's a mixer still on the roof, on the on the third level up, because I'm not done pouring concrete up there. But we've robbed the, the handle that locks it in place and uh, some other piece we needed. We ro we've robbed two pieces off of it already up there. So I'll have to, to get that replaced when I get back over there. We've fixed them before. You know, it's not hard to do. Yes, he is in this picture also. Uh, we've seen what the uh, rough uh, cut on the dirt is. That's which, just where you shovel it out of the way. Um, they'll stomp down the, the clumps and and uh, put the plastic down. And then they have these little concrete uh, rebar chairs. We call them biscuits, you know, because he's a baker. So uh, they just made 200 biscuits for these two floors. Because you don't want uh, uh, con rebar laying on, on the bottom. It doesn't do any good down there. Actually, you can run a crack from down there. You want three times the diameter of the rebar's cover. So that's what he's uh, made the biscuits to be. Inch and, inch and a half, I think. Okay, so uh, y'all say a little prayer for us. <laughs> uh, we're going to have uh, updates uh, going ongoing on the uh, second floor. And uh, I'm thinking after that, we're going to pour the floor for the solar panels. Uh, I did a video which is titled with house building stuff. But it's about how to find uh, true solar south. Uh, 
because compasses don't read south, they read magnetic north and south. And the iron in the Earth's core, uh, the worst place in the world is off 15 degrees. But most places it's between 3 to 7, you know, around in that range. You learn that when you fly airplanes because uh, you have magnetic compasses in the airplane. And uh, you have to correct the uh, magnetic compass before you even start correcting for wind drift. Or you'll never get to where you're going. Or you can go by Omni radio stations, which is tedious. You don't fly an airplane to do the most tedious thing you can do in your life. You know, it's, it's supposed to enjoy it and not only enjoy it, changing radio channels from to to from. So uh, nowadays we have GPS and they're so damn cheap. I think you can get a, a GPS moving map for like $1,700. And it has a radio altimeter, altimeter in it. Does that does everything a whole uh, cockpit would do years ago. And for about the price, the price of an regular altimeter. So uh, why would you not have it? Rental airplanes have them now. That's, I mean, all the experimentals had them first because they don't have to be certified. They can use the uh, experimental fleet as uh, guinea pigs. We call it the guinea pig discount. You, you, you get it for about a fourth the price it costs to produce it. And, uh, and there's no guarantee it'll work or it'll last. But uh, first one, you know, first group. Okay, say a little prayer for us. Have a nice day, and we're going to sign off.